Today, we'll be talking about Destination Earth Star. And just to get this out of the way real quick and satisfy all the pedantics out there, yes, we know Earth is not a star. Planets are not stars. Stars are stars, and planets are planets. Earth is a planet. So, you know, already we're off to a bad start. But, title aside, the NES game was developed by Imagineering, who were known for A Boy and His Blob, Ghostbusters 2, Heavy Shredden, The Simpsons NES games, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, and just piles upon piles of mediocre and janky games on the system. And if you're a longtime viewer of NES Friend, then you know dang well who's responsible for this. None other than Gary Kitchen. That's right, the kitchen is back. And if Battle Tank was any indication of how much this guy loves cockpit interiors, well, get ready to have half your screen taken up by superfluous information. As Gary do, he did think to design in some variety so you get both first-person cockpit stages and side-scrolling space shooter stages to tolerate. Why did I just use the word tolerate? Well, let's see what's up. As the story goes, Earth, well, you've only ever heard about it. You've never been. It's been a while since anyone in your lineage has actually been there. Your elders have talked it up, and as a people, you've tried to keep its cultures and traditions alive. Your people were kidnapped by the Kojans a couple hundred years ago and kept as slaves. As a long story short, you're escaping and going back home to Earth, planet. Your destination is Earth, planet. You'll have to travel through eight star systems to do it, and wouldn't you know it, each one is lousy with terrestrial terrorists poised to attack anyone who enters their star system, so good luck. This is one of those games that if you jump into it without a little research in what to do, you're going to be bored and confused. If you figure out what to do, you'll at least only be bored, so that's good. The game tosses you right into a cockpit view in a vast, desolate region of space. That grid map on the left is everything in these cockpit stages. It won't make much sense at first, but all you need to know is that circles represent planets, numbers represent a number of enemy ships in that sector, A represents an armory, and B represents a base, where you can refuel or repair your ship. The points of these stages is to first and foremost, rid the entire map of enemies. So fly to where there are numbers and hunt for bad guys. Once all the enemies are killed, a new area appears on your grid map. This one is denoted by a highlighted letter B to indicate the enemy's base. You'll go there and enter the planet's orbit and the game will transform into a side-scrolling space shooter. But before we get ahead of ourselves, a few things to know about space combat. Once you enter a sector inhabited by enemies, check your radar in the lower right for a 360 degree view of the enemies around you. If there is one in front of you, check to the right of this view and you can align your height so that you and the enemy ship are on the same plane. I will say, while this game has long stints of tedious boredom that would likely be inherent to space travel, there was a lot of consideration put into this facet of the game. You'll get a full 3D experience here and it's decent for the NES. If there are two enemies in the sector, the lower right screen will show your alignment in relation to the second ship. In the lower middle is an array of numbers. It's not the best way to present the information as it looks too busy and incomprehensible when you're focused on so many other things. But here you can see the weapon you've selected, your speed, the number of enemies remaining, and the energy you have left. In the lower right, beneath the 360 degree radar, is your ship's damage. All of this information is important, but it's not all important at the same time. You should be good on energy for a while, but if you start running low, or your ship has taken a lot of damage, just make your way toward a B square. As for velocity when traveling from one area to another, go full throttle. But when it comes to combat or landing on a planet, you need to slow her down there, partner. It's easy to keep the enemies in view when you've slowed down a bit, and you can't even land on planets unless you slow down considerably and line it up perfectly on screen. You have a few weapons to choose from when dogfighting in space. You'll start with a laser gun that can easily overheat if used too much, but has unlimited ammo, and some torpedoes that easily wipe out enemies, but are limited. As you advance through the game, other weapons come available. To change weapons, you press start to cycle through them, and pressing select essentially does the same thing, meaning there's no way to pause the space roaming stages. A massive bummer since these sections are pretty long to get through. Once you've cleared the map of enemies and have done all the planet exploration you intend to do, it's time to take on the enemy base. Now, you're in a side-scrolling shooter environment and it's quite janky. There are plenty of power-ups and extra lives to collect, almost like they knew they made a rocky experience for you to survive. There are forking paths, but I don't think you can become lost or softlock yourself by going the wrong way. You'll eventually end up at the boss, which typically amounts to... this. 
just floating orbs or something? Or some other space debris nonsense? I mean, how menacing? Enemies will approach from behind and the narrow passages will cause some trouble. It's here where the game can really take the wind out of your sails, but at least it's more active than the cockpit stages. So I can't complain too much about Gary wanting to break up the monotony some, I just wish it were better made. The cockpit stages are decent for what they are, and if this had an Air Fortress or even a Zexus level of polish around this concept, this game would be much higher regarded, but as it stands it wavers between tedious boredom and then janky difficulty spikes. And you have to repeat this eight times, each with graduated difficulty. A casual run of the game can take a couple hours because of that. Musically, I like the main track quite a bit. And those with a good ear will make the obvious connection to a boy and his blobs main theme. Both games were released in 1990 by Imagineering, and both were composed by Mark Van Heck, who composed music for most of Imagineering's titles. Again, the music is fun and upbeat, but there's just not a lot of it, so you'll be hearing the same ditties over and over as you slog your way through this rather long space adventure. Ultimately, I have to appreciate what Gary and the gang were trying to do here. This is the NES after all, and Imagineering managed to assemble an experience that allowed players to drift through space, fight enemies, and visit multiple planets in what at the time felt like a vast solar system. It suffers from a lot of the same issues many of Imagineering's games do. Certain aspects of it, like the side-scrolling space shooter stages, feel undercooked. This one also lacks a personality. You don't meet any characters or see any characters, there are no bosses, and the reward for winning doesn't even lead to a cutscene. They were onto something with this idea, but just did not quite deliver in the same way games like Air Fortress or Zexus did on the genre-fused sci-fi space experience. The legacy of this game was mostly dead on arrival. There were no ports, no re-releases, no follow-ups, no sequels. It's largely been forgotten, and perhaps that's for the best. That's going to do it for Destination Earth Star on the NES, and as always, planets are planets, and stars are stars, and thanks for watching.